So we'll start with what prompted you to undertake this research. So the, the abstracts that we're going to talk about are sub-analyses of the parent studies. And the parent studies with anafrolumab, and I should provide a little bit, bit of background about anafrolumab. It's a monoclonal antibody against the type 1 interferon receptor. And we've actually known since, wow, it goes back a long time, to the 1970s that interferons were important in lupus. And the burning question has been for the last 20 years or so, whether inhibiting the interferon pathway would provide an improvement in disease activity in lupus patients. All right, but back to the, to the studies. So it's actually a year ago that the TULIP studies were presented at the American College of Rheumatology meeting. I was the global principal investigator for TULIP-1 and Eric Moran for TULIP-2. And TULIP-2 was a positive study. TULIP-1 did not hit the endpoint, but there were a lot of secondaries that were positive. Both studies have been published. And again, the presentations, and there are actually a lot of presentations at the, at the ACR meeting this year, I forget exactly how many, seven or eight, that are all sub-analyses of the parent studies. Now, why did we do these sub-analyses? Well, it really revolves a lot around the heterogeneity of lupus. And I like to use the analogy to snowflakes. When we outline therapy for a patient, it's got to be customized, focusing on the most severe manifestation. Some people will say that lupus is a thousand different diseases. And, uh, you know, there's probably some truth to that. So no two patients are alike, just like snowflakes. Some might have severe arthritis, some may have rash, some may have kidney disease, and the list goes on and on. So when a new therapy comes along, clinicians need to know if it preferentially treats certain manifestations. And that one was analyzed in the studies that we'll talk about. So it's a look at which organ systems responded to intervention with anafrolumab. So what are some of the key takeaways from this research? Well, the organ domain study was presented by Eric Moran, and he's sleeping right now, so we won't wake him up. He's, he's in Australia, so what time is it there? It's probably around uh, 3 a.m., but he was the lead author on this particular abstract. And basically, it, it, he and his colleagues evaluated responses in the various domains that are components of BILAG and SLEDA. Those are two activity indices that are components of the composite outcome measures that we used in the parent studies, known as BICLA and SRI. And at one year, greater numbers of patients with anafrolumab treatment improved in the mucocutaneous and musculoskeletal domains. Now, why did we focus on those domains? Well, those are the most common clinical manifestations. And when patients enter into a clinical research trial focusing on extrarenal manifestations, most of the patients will have arthritis or rash or both. Now, I don't recall the exact differences at one year between the groups, but I think they were around 10 or 15 percent in favor of anafrolumab over placebo. Now, you have to remember in our studies, placebo is not just placebo. Placebo is probably more appropriately, or at least that group is more appropriately called standard of care. Patients come in on their background therapies, and those therapies could be steroids, anti-malarials, immunosuppressives, and then they'll have either anafrolumab or placebo added. And then uh, focusing on arthritis, there were higher percentages of patients who were treated with anafrolumab who achieved the endpoint, which was a 50% reduction in the tender and swollen joint counts. So the bottom line is that there was evidence that anafrolumab worked for arthritis and also skin disease. But focusing on skin disease, there's yet another presentation, and that was by another investigator, that was by Vicki Wirth, who presented the ability of anafrolumab to reduce cutaneous disease activity using a measure called class. And at week 12, which was the endpoint for this sub-analysis, 46% of the cohort 
who entered the study with a high classy activity score, and that was 10 or greater, responded at a level of 50% reduction in the activity score. Whereas in the placebo group, the value is 25%. So it's 46% versus 25%. And that's a very significant difference. These findings confirmed actually what we saw in phase two, that cutaneous lupus responds very nicely to anaphrolimab. And not only does it respond nicely, it responds quickly. And that's why the endpoint of, of 12 weeks was chosen in this sub-analysis. So did any of the study's findings surprise you, although perhaps not their responsiveness, but any other surprises? Uh, not really. I mean, a quick and robust skin response, as I mentioned, was predicted in the, by the phase two study. Now arthritis, which is another major manifestation of lupus, is very difficult to assess as joint tenderness and swelling are incorporated into the outcome measures, but the, the swelling and tenderness is not as exuberant as what we see in rheumatoid arthritis. So there may be a lot greater subjectivity in doing these assessments, and this could explain the more modest results and some of the variable responses in the musculoskeletal domain. And what limitations did the studies have? I can't think of too many. Uh, maybe for skin, it would be nice to know which types of cutaneous lupus the patients had. So for example, there's acute cutaneous, there's subacute cutaneous, and there's chronic cutaneous. And if you go back many years, they were all lumped together just as cutaneous lupus. But these days, we're actually starting to separate the three types. So it would have been nice to have had the subtypes known to basically to see if the responses were the same across all three groups or whether there were differential responses. And for arthritis, as I mentioned, but this is not really a study specific issue, we do need better tools that can be applied to these large global studies that we use. It's all just palpating the joint assessing for tenderness and assessing for swelling. I mean, there is technology available such as ultrasound and MRI, but for a large global study, that would create logistic nightmares. Are there any future research plans in the pipeline for this? Well, right now, everybody's hard at work converting these abstracts into papers that will provide a lot more detail. There's a ton of data that still needs to be analyzed. Uh, for example, it would be great to know about the molecular signatures and how they predict response. But the key is awaiting a decision from the FDA regarding the approval of this drug. Sounds like everybody's got their hands full of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, is there any last closing comments or information, Dr. Fury, that you'd like to add? Well, it's just uh, speaking to lupus drug development in general. We started in the early 1990s, and we've only had one drug approved for lupus via the route of a randomized controlled trial. And it's not for lack of trying, it's just lupus is an incredibly difficult nut to crack. And I could go on for hours about why that is the case. Patients need safer therapies, more efficacious therapies. So I think we're finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. There were three positive lupus nephritis trials, and it could very well be that two of them will lead to drug approvals for lupus kidney disease. Now, we didn't really talk about that, but that's probably the most severe common manifestation of lupus. But we do need drugs for our patients with extra renal disease. And I think the totality of the anaphrolimab data would create um, reasons to approve the drug. So I view this program as a, as a success, and we'll see what the regulatory authorities see next year. This was great. Sounds like a lot of exciting things, hopefully, to be coming out in the near future then. Oh, so all these efforts, and we have been trying for a long time, will translate into better outcomes for our patients, no doubt. 
Well, thank you for all you're doing for them. And thank you for taking the time again to chat with us about it. All right, you're welcome. Thanks everybody.